One billion people traveled internationally last year. This is a quite an important industry and one of the most influential industries in the world. It impacts our lives, it impacts the environment, it impacts climate, it impacts indigenous communities. Wherever you think about, whatever you think about, travel impacts it significantly. But before I talk about travel and why it is vacationing for peace and why it is such an important industry for us to think about and try to impact, try to influence, to change, I want to tell you about my life. Now, I'm talking about peace. However, I did not grow up as someone who believed in peace, coexistence, reconciliation. These seemed ridiculous ideas for me when I was a kid. This is from my hometown, Jerusalem which, as we all know, is very famous for being the most peaceful place on Earth. Not. I grew up in Jerusalem. I'm the youngest of seven kids. This is me when I used to be good-looking back in the days, the little one. That's my older brother, Taysir. And I remember when I was a kid, growing up in a conflict zone, it's a bit different probably than how you grew up. So I'll ask you a couple of questions. What did you take with you when you were a kid to school? What was the most important thing you had to make sure? Pencil and paper, anything else? Backpack, lunch, yeah. These are all important things. I took with me an onion. This was the most important thing to take with me to school. Anybody can guess why? For what? To cry. My mom gave me the onion, so I don't think she disliked me that much. I, I was the seventh, so maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. You see, none of you have been to some protests, I can tell. So I came home one day to my mother, and I told her, listen, I understand you really think education is important, but I got fired that tear gas. There were clashes on the way back to school, uh, from school. And I felt I'm going to suffocate and die. And therefore, I think education is not more important than my life. And I made a very good case why I shouldn't go to school anymore. I thought I'll convince her because I thought she liked me. Uh, but instead, she gave me an onion. She said, every time you fire that tear gas, you take this onion, you put it by nose, and it will actually help you survive. Um, and that's what I did. That became the most important. If we don't have fresh onions, I am not going to school. But that's what it means to grow up in a conflict zone. These things are normal part of your life. When I was nine years old, my older brother, who you see in this photo, Taysir, was arrested from my home on suspicion of throwing rocks at soldiers. He was taken to prison, was beat up in the prison, ended up there just a bit less than a year. And upon his release, he had internal injuries, took him to a hospital, and a few days after a surgery, he ended up dying as a result of the internal injuries he had in prison. I was 10 years old then. And I want you to imagine being 10 years old, seeing your brother being killed. I remember the soldiers who came and picked him up. I remember how angry I felt. It almost felt like if I just come down here and for no reason, I walk to you and I go, bam, 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 and I punch you. None of you even intervened if I was really punching here. Come on, people. What would be your first reaction if I did that? Anyone? What would you do? Hold me back. Come on, a bit more honesty. What would you do if somebody just shows up and punch you? Oh, yeah, punch back. How many of you, if somebody punches you in the face, your first thought is, wait a second, let me take a few steps back and think about this logically. That's not what we do. And when you're 10 years old, if somebody punch you, back, punch you, you want to punch back. If somebody kills your brother, you feel revenge is the only way forward. And that's how I felt, is that revenge is the only way. And for the next eight years, that's really what my life was about. Until I was 18 and went to study Hebrew. 
as a Palestinian, I speak Arabic as my mother tongue, and Hebrew is the language of Israelis, which in this case to me was the language of people who killed my brother. And yet it was in that class that first time I met the other. It was only traveling about 15 minutes, 20 minutes walk from my home to go to the other side that I've never been to. The closest trip possible, and yet sometimes the closest trip possible is the most impactful trip we can take. And in that Hebrew class was my first time meeting Jewish-Israeli people. And slowly we became friends. We got to know each other over funny things in the beginning because we didn't have enough language to argue. Music. I love something called Western country music. Anybody heard of it? Not many Palestinians love country music. I might be the only one. And in that classroom, I find a couple of Jewish kids who also liked country music, and we got along listening to Johnny Cash together. Stuff like this that made a huge difference for us. We realized that we are divided not by just actual walls and checkpoints. We are divided by walls of ignorance, of fear, and of hatred. In that classroom, I realized it's not us versus them, as in us Palestinians versus them Israelis, but rather us, those who believe in coexistence versus those who don't. Martin Luther King said, men often hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they cannot communicate. They cannot communicate because they are separated. In one of his last interviews, Stephen Hawking said, the human failings I would most like to correct is aggression. And this is what I decided I want my life to be about, traveling around the world, finding different conflicts, and try to find solutions for it. The amazing things I found as I did that, from Afghanistan to Iran to Syria to Colombia, all these conflict zones, I found that inability to communicate, to see each other, to understand each other, is the biggest problem we face. But sometimes it's inability to even hear the voices that exist. This is a little boy I met in Zatari refugee camp in Jordan, a Syrian kid, and I remember him coming, walking toward me and picking this thing in his hand. You know what it is? A piece of trash. And he was so excited about it. I thought he was excited about me, so I'm getting my camera, I wanna know. He was excited about this piece of trash, why? Because he's got nothing. You can look at the refugee camp. Nothing. And I thought, oh, I'm going to tell this kid's story. And later I thought, this isn't this kid's story. It's actually mine. And so I went back and took some cameras. And I got Nagi on board. And I gave these kids the cameras and asked them to take the photos. What do you think they took photos of? How terrible their lives are? How horrible the tent? These are the photos they took. I really didn't like this one much because I'm like, I have this fancy, nice camera, and in two days, these kids took better photos than I've ever taken. <laughs> photos of themselves and the most important sports in the world. And then I met with Anwar, who was 14 years old, and she wrote this letter with her photo. To whom it may concern, these words I read every day and my UNHCR Asylum Seeker Certificate. I'm a Syrian child. The only thing I hope in the world is to wake up from this terrible nightmare, to return to my friends, to return to my life, to my home before this war. And if the time goes back, I just want to play with the people who lost their lives, and I will ask them to leave Syria. I never thought that I would live in a tent, but that's all right. I never thought that I would not listen to my English teacher whom I love so much in Syria, but that's all right. I never thought that I will not breathe the smells of Syrian fields in summer nights, but that's all right. But to whom it may concern, please stop war and let me go back to my past life. And I thought, how many people travel to Jordan and never hear somebody like her? I would tell you, 99.99999% of tourists will go to Jordan, see the Petra, see Jarosh, see all the amazing sites, and forget there are people there. And so I worked actually with Anwar and helped her develop her story, go to college, and now I get her to tons of the trips. Pretty much every few days, 
she is speaking to travelers to tell them her story and tell, her, tell them the story of travelers who go there. Travel to me is an act of peacemaking. This is my business partner. We started a company called Mejdi Tours together. He's Jewish, I'm Palestinian. Already peacemaking is happening there. When we started our business, people told us, be aware of each other. You can't trust him, he's Jewish. Or they'll tell him, don't trust him, he's Arab. And we wanted to make travel about hearing other narratives. We started in Jerusalem. We would have an Israeli and a Palestinian co-leading a tour together. And imagine putting two people who everyone perceives as an enemy. But because no place has a single story, no place is homogenous. And yet when we travel, somehow there's a one narrative. And we wanted to challenge that. Not only hear these two, two people speak about their two narratives, but also get to meet archaeologists, historians, kind of like almost what we hear here on the, on the stage. Get to hear the different views, the different stories that often are ignored and get people to tell those stories to the travelers in addition to all the fun sightseeing. This is in Northern Ireland where I got these two, James and Anne, both of them fought on the opposite side in Northern Ireland. One is Catholic, one is Protestant. James spent five years in prison for his militant activities. And yet, you see enemies here. It's amazing to see them work, care for each other, realize that there's a different vision that is possible, and yet often travel ignores these stories. We often go to beautiful places like Moster, in Bosnia and, didn't, and don't know that this is one of the most divided places in the world. On one side you have Bosniak Muslims, and the other side you have Croat Christians, Catholics, and almost never meet, never go to the same restaurants, never go to school even together. And we go and enjoy these places and never hear those stories. In environmental stuff, we can go to beautiful places and not talk about endangered animals, creatures, what is our impact as travelers on wildlife. This is the red shank monkey in Vietnam. There are less than 10,000 left of this animal, one of the most beautiful, and yet you can go to Vietnam and never know that this creature exists, and it's one of my favorite. Every time I go, I have to go and check on them. Travel is about collecting memories, about connecting with people, not just collecting photographs. I'm going to skip this video because it's been a bit longer, but go online and check uh, the New Zealand uh, campaign for traveling under the influence of social media. And it's a hilarious video that goes it through New Zealand saying, don't go to the same places, take the exact same photo that travelers everywhere in the world do. Try to find something different. Try to find something new. Travel is an act of diplomacy. This is a photo I took of Mr. Pumpkin, as he calls himself, in Bogota, in Colombia. And Mr. Pumpkin used to be a gang leader, killed people, had seven people in his family killed, and last time he got out of prison, he thought, I'm not going back. He reached out to some people and said, can I go into the travel industry? Can I become a tour guide? And he did, and he told me, I used to, any tourist coming to my neighborhood, make sure they leave without their phone. Now, I tell them my story. I tell them what I did. And I walk them through my town. And we have all these graffitis. And I explain the graffitis. And I explain why I ended up doing what, what I was doing. And everyone in his gang decided to do the same thing. And the whole town ended up transformed through travel. This is in Vietnam, where going there, meeting with these guys who, um, who fought in the war in Vietnam, where they call it the American War, as Americans call it the Vietnam War. And an incredible story, I brought a few Americans to meet with them, and every media outlet in Vietnam was existed. Oh, you want to hear our narrative, our part of the story as well. Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely, on these accounts. In places like Egypt, people go, see the pyramids, it's beautiful, it's amazing. I get it. But then just in historic Cairo, there's this place called Garbage Collector City. I'll admit, not the best name for tourism. But this is where 85% of garbage 
gets recycled in Cairo. 85%. You know what's the highest number in Europe? 48%. And yet, you can go to Egypt and think, yeah, poor and, and not as developed, and yeah, they have history that is amazing. This is happening today. And it's one of the most fun, impactful things to do. You learn about the industry, you meet people, the whole town is Christian, Egyptians, and yet often we can, not often, I know very, very few people go there because I think I might be one of the only people trying to convince his travelers, this is worth traveling to. It is an act of diplomacy, act of connecting to a story. This is my father, he's 86 years old now, I have a couple of stories, and I'll finish with that. My dad and I argue a lot, which is not fun in the moment. However, it's fun when I tell stories after about him. I had him come and visit me in the U.S. a few years back, and he got there and he said, I want to go to the mosque to pray on Friday. And I said, fine, we'll send you to the mosque. And I set him up with somebody who took him, and then he came back, and I said, so how was the mosque? And he said, oh, we didn't go to the mosque. I'm like, where do you go? He said, uh, the mosque was full. I'm like, so you prayed outside, it's cold, it was winter. He said, no, no, we went across the street to the synagogue. Said, you went to the synagogue to pray on Friday. What, what exactly is happening? He said, well, because the mosque is full, the, the Muslims rent the synagogue from the Jewish community, and we go and pray, we went and prayed there. And he was very excited about it. My dad grew up in Jerusalem. You know how many synagogues are in Jerusalem? A lot. And I asked him, how many times have you been in a synagogue before? Nil. Never been in a synagogue. It took him to travel to be able to do something different, to be able to reach across. So the people who live right next door, it took him to go to the U.S. to be able to do it and realize, oh, it's okay to go to a synagogue. Start calling my family and being like, hey, I have a story. Guess where I prayed today? And my uncle, my brothers, my cousins on the phone will be like, it's Friday, you prayed in the mosque. And he said, no, I prayed in a synagogue. And they all look at me and Zoom and they'll be like, as he said, you convert our dad to Judaism? <laughs> no, you don't understand. Jews and Muslims can't get along. We are not doomed to live in conflict. We do not have to kill each other. And it was through travel that my dad was able to figure that out. There's a story a poem by an Israeli poet named Yehuda Amichai. And the poem goes that if you're walking by a building and you, uh, sorry, it says if you are a tourist, a tour group, they're going with their tour, tour guide. And he stands by a place called David's Gate in Jerusalem. Pretty cool. And he says, there's a man sitting with fruit and vegetables there. And the tour guide says, you see this man there? He's sitting with his fruit and vegetables. Not important. A little bit up, a little bit to the left. There is a Roman arch. It's 2,000 years old. And then the same poet goes, redemption will come when that same tour guide will say, you see that Roman arch up there? A little bit to the right, a little bit down. There is a man with fruit and vegetables for his family. That's what matters. Thank you.